Reformation's Acts and Monuments came at the right time in the English Protestant Church. Protestants, including Fox himself, were being exiled and persecuted under Queen Mary's reign. But with the rise of a new queen, Elizabeth, and the publication of Fox's Acts and Monuments, also known as Book of Martyrs, a greater sense of community was built within the Protestant Church. Inside, the book is filled with descriptions of influential moments in the history of the Church and the Protestant Reformation, including papal persecutions, the life of John Calvin, persecutions under Queen Mary, life of Martin Luther, persecutions in the Netherlands and Germany, and basically a lot of death. In fact, out of 22 chapters, 16 have the word persecution in the title, probably why it's called the Book of Martyrs. So after a period of exile, you can see why this resonated so much with the Protestants. Finally, after all their suffering, there was a book to document their suffering. And now, this isn't a book you could just carry around. This is no pocket-sized Bible. Wilson Library's copy is about 40 centimeters in width and about this big in height. So it's the size of a small child, and you can see why not everybody had a copy. But at the same time, everybody knew about it. And when the second edition was published... In 1570, it was double the size of the first, so just to emphasize, this book is huge. But its size is just one clear indication of how Acts and Monuments was used. Its immaculate condition, as well as its large density, indicate that not only were copies uncommon and common at the same time, but that John Fox's work was treated with as much care as a physical copy of the Bible. So, a little bit more about the physical copy in Wilson Library. It's a burgundy red cover and red brine pages with an appropriate amount of scuff, but that's it. For a book that was published in 1684, this book is spotless. No mysterious stains or cryptic handwritten notes in the margins or even on the back cover. Not even one dog-eared page. This book was purposely kept immaculate for 300 years. I mean, I have a book for one week and there's a good chance you'll find at least one pizza-related stain and a page torn in half. So, what does this say about the book? Well, for one thing, Acts and Monuments was kept in high regard. Think of how many books we've flipped through with at least one note in the margins. Textbooks, novels, even copies of the Bible. None of them were Acts and Monuments. This doesn't mean there were no need for notes in the margins. In fact, there are notes in the margins, but they're actually printed with the book and used as a sort of dictionary mode of clarification on the side. And clearly, there's a lot going on within the book, so it would need some sort of margin writing. But it's amazing that it was print when the margins were printed, that was considered the last word. Think about it. After all the time that has passed, some 300 odd years, you'd think at least one person would think of something to enhance the piece or add to it. But they never did. This word, written in Acts and Monuments, was law to the readers. And... Just as you wouldn't dare write in the Bible to enhance it, believe me, you wouldn't question even writing in Acts and Monuments. In addition, Acts and Monuments' size plays a major role in how it was used back in the 17th century. As previously mentioned, this book is huge, meaning in all likelihood that copies of this were not common and where they were found, they were shared, like a copy of the Bible. So it was never just one person reading about persecutions of the Quakers. It was a community reading about, together about persecutions. As a result, reading Acts and Monuments became kind of a shared experience, especially after a period of exile, a book that told a story of Protestants that had suffered definitely created a bond within the community. Not only that, but it empowered the people. The Protestants of England were working for a higher cause to avenge the persecution of the martyrs whose stories they read. While a smaller version could have been more easily distributed, Acts and Monuments' influence was visible just by its size. Think about it. You see someone holding an average-sized novel, and what do you think they're holding? Clockwork Orange, some young adult dystopian novel that uses the same vocabulary complexity as a fourth grader, or maybe it's just one of the millions of copies of Fifty Shades of Grey, but if it's a giant book and it takes two hands to carry down the street, how many things could it be? A lever pop-up book for children, a barefoot Contessa cookbook, a different kind of cookbook. <laughs> the point is, it'd have to be some sort of very important book, like Acts and Monuments. And as a result, those that read it felt they had an important cause or purpose. Unfortunately, this had some dangerous consequences.
as history will tell you, those invested enough in a cause will go through absurd lengths to protect it. To the Protestants, after being exiled, this was the time to finally stand in their homeland proudly with their religion, and John Fox's Acts and Monuments became a symbol of that. Think of Acts and Monuments like a Third Testament to Christianity's canonical Old and New Testament. And that would make sense. It may not have been written entirely the same style as the Bible, but the contents were similar. Moral stories and heroes that die in the name of their faith? It's no wonder Book of Martyrs was so appealing. The narrative had been told before, just different time and place. Nonetheless, Acts and Monuments represented a new era for the Protestants. It represented a new chapter in the history of the church, so much so that it almost instilled more religious intolerance. You know the whole nickname Bloody Mary for Queen Mary? Well, John Fox took part in that. Chapter 16, Persecution in England during the reign of Queen, Queen Mary. Fox wrote, We earnestly pray that the annals of no country, Catholic or pagan, may ever be stained with such a repetition of human sacrifice to papal power, and that the detestation in which the character of Mary is holden may be a beacon to succeeding monarchs to avoid the rocks of fanaticism. So in today's words... <laughs> He thought Mary was the worst monarch the country has ever seen, and he hopes no other political entity is subjected to someone like her. That's pretty savage. And it's clear that Acts and Monuments was far from impartial. But nonetheless, it was worshipped like it was the Third Testament. In fact, the second edition, you know, the one that was really big with 2,500 pages, was mandated to be in every church, town hall, college, or general gathering space you could think of, and it became the book to read. According to historian Douglas Campbell, up until the publication of this book called The Pilgrim's Progress, people had two things to read. The Bible and John Fox. Think of it like today's Harry Potter, except a lot less magic and a lot more persecution. But anyway, you can imagine how this reading this influenced the people of England. After reading the Holy Word of the Bible, they could read the gruesome details of how other Protestants were murdered in the name of the Bible. Or, even if they couldn't read, they could see printed illustrations of the excruciating violent persecutions. Naturally, this riled up a sense of pride, and like I said, Acts and Monuments acted as a symbol. Some critics even say that John Fox's work could be viewed as propaganda on Queen Elizabeth's behalf because of how Mary's Catholic reign was described. What's even crazier is that as a result of its publication, the Catholic myth came into play. The Catholic myth was basically the conspiracy theory that at any given moment, Catholics were plotting to overthrow the government and enslave the people. And John Fox's countless descriptions of martyrdom definitely did not disprove that. But what does this all have to do with the physical copy of the book? Well, remember how I said that a copy of Acts and Monuments was placed in every communal space possible? Well, they were just placed in every space possible. They were put on display. Kind of like a baby in a baby shower. You had to acknowledge it or what we're even doing there. In a way, Acts and Monuments made itself known. There, now, this is no coffee table book that was left out and about like 1500 works in the Louvre or that book where Jennifer Aniston and Owen Wilson are married and they have a dog. Things called Marley and Me. Um, in fact, the only book really comparable was the Bible because you didn't just leave the Bible out like it was a rambunctious kid in the middle of July. No, you didn't just lose acts and monuments. Just as middle school kids make room for Jesus when they slow dance, you made room for acts and monuments in your home. I mean, you had to, the thing is huge. And as previously mentioned, it was kept spotless. No stains, no inscriptions, not even any abnormal smells. Clearly, John Fox's acts and monuments was a point of pride and a symbol in the Protestant church. And I feel like I should note that although this book was massive, it said that at one point there were 10,000 copies of it in England. And as more editions were published, so were serials, making it even more popular. It became so popular, in fact, that it was the second most produced book in England for a time, besides the Bible, obviously. And 
In a way, it defied all odds set by its size and so became one of the most common books in England. And since this is a literature and digital age class, I feel it's necessary to briefly discuss the various encodings available all over the internet. In all honesty, an electronic version does not do John Fox justice. The content is identical, but the gravity and importance of the book is, is not easily conveyed. Online, you can not marvel at how on earth this book has managed to look so good after 300 years. I mean, most books look like they've been through a blender after just 10 years. And you cannot see how much this book was cared for, and you cannot begin to imagine just how delicately it was handled based on the text you read online. So in conclusion, you can tell a lot about John Fox's acts and monuments importance just based on its appearance today. You can tell that while it was still read all across England, it was cared for and treated like the Third Testament of the Bible. And you just can't get that online.